Okay, now we're in the main session. Yes, okay. Sorry. Technical technical problems. Okay, so let me uh, very quickly introduce uh, Yang. Um, Yang is a PhD student at Stanford uh, with uh, Aaron Sitford. Uh, and he has already in a short amount of time done uh, lots of amazing work, um, including getting maximum flow in unit capacity graphs uh, down to M to the four thirds. Uh, which is a very cool piece of work. Uh, but today he's going to tell us about uh, other progress on maximum flow, namely breaking the Goldberg Rao running time, which has has been around since uh, 1980. Sorry, 98. Uh, this is for sparse graphs, but uh, I think I'll just let you get started. And thanks, Yang, for, for talking to us. Thanks, Rasmus, for the wonderful introduction and for having me present today. So, as as uh, as he described, I'm going to be talking about um, how to use a dynamic version of electric flows to speed up the runtime for max flow on sparse capacitated graphs. How do I? Oh, and let me maybe just add that like people should feel free to ask questions in the chat or the question thing, and I'll try to pay attention to them and, and point out to you if they're. Yeah, and also feel free to interrupt me at various times. I'll try to pause so we can take questions. Okay, so the way I'm going to structure the talk is I'm first going to introduce flow problems in general. Then I'm going to talk about the, the dynamic electric flow problem we solve and how we solve it. Finally, I'm going to put all the pieces together to try to convince you that at least we get some algorithm that solves max flow on sparse capacitated graphs then runs in time less than m to the 1.5. For some reason, clicking left and right isn't working, so I need to yeah click every get to the next slide. Okay, I'll start by introducing the maximum flow problem. Um, max flow problem on a directed graph G with n vertices and m edges. Um, every edge has a capacity in the range 1 to k2, which we can just think of as some polynomial in the number of vertices for the purposes of this talk. There's two special vertices, the source vertex S and the sink T. And the goal of the max flow problem is to route as much flow from S to T as possible such that the amount of flow on edge E, which is directed, is between zero and its capacity UE. Additionally, all non-ST vertices have to have equal incoming and outgoing flow, and we call this the demand constraint. For example, given this graph with the capacities listed, um, this following graph is, is a flow on it. Um, it's given in orange. As you can see, Every vertex that isn't S or T has equal incoming and outgoing flow. For example, this vertex is three units incoming and three units outgoing. Additionally, S and T both have four units incoming and outgoing, so the flow in this graph is four. Um, also, notationally, we're going to let F um, be the flow vector. So here, F is just the assignment of real numbers to the edges given by how much flow is on the edge. So the numbers written down basically are the flow vector in this instance. There's several small variations you can make to the problem I just described that actually make it easier to think about for the purposes of this talk. First, you can assume the decision version. Um, we're going to assume whether we can, we're, we're going to ask whether it's possible to route capital F units from S to T instead of asking for what is the maximum. This is reducible to the decision version up to high accuracy via a binary search. Additionally, uh, the, on the previous slide, I was asking about general, asking about ST demand. So there's a single source and a single T. Generalize this to more complicated demands. For example, you would ask, can I route a flow that satisfies these constraints such that the vertex V has no D sub V? In other words, the total outgoing minus the amount of incoming flow is D sub V. This is actually reducible to ST max flow by adding a super source in the super sink. So we're going to also, so uh, we can assume that we're just working with ST max flow even though we solve this more 
general problem of general demands. Throughout, we're going to let dv uh, be called a demand vector, and the sum of the demands on vertices has to equal zero. Um, additionally, I mentioned on the previous slide that we wanted to solve directed max flow. We're actually going to assume undirected max flow uh, because there's a reduction from directed to undirected max flow in the exact case. As for why we're going to study the max flow problem, it's a very fundamental problem with decades of extensive research. And historically, improvements on the max flow problem have led to improvements in, like, uh, improvements trying to solve the max flow problem have led to improvements to solve several other types of problems. For example, um, LP, like p norm regression problems. Uh, Additionally, there's several direct applications of solving max flow, including minimum ST cuts, bipartite matching, like scheduling, transportation, and clustering problems. And finally, methods for solving the max flow problem, especially recently based on more optimization principles, uh, they often extend to more general classes of problems. For example, min cost flows, negative weight shortest paths, min cost matching, or optimal transport. At this point, I'm going to describe what was the previous work that was known on max flow. Um, so we have this table here, which is really the classical work on max flow, that's what I'm going to call it. Um, uh, beyond Ford, 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 Ford Fulkerson, um, I want to point you to a couple results in this table. Uh, first, I'm going to point you to the result of Goldberg Rao. Um, this is, was the fastest known running time for capacitive max flow. In other words, logarithmic dependence on the capacities uh, on sparse graphs. So on a sparse graph, this random time n to the 1.5 times polylogarithmic factors in the number of edges and the capacities. This was the fastest. Another result in this table I wanted to point you guys to is the result of um, Galil Namad and Slater on solving strongly polynomial max flow. So here, polynomial means that there's no dependence on the weights at all. Um, the reason this result is interesting is that this was an early use of applying data structures, for example, link cut trees or dynamic trees, to speed up the iterations of a max flow algorithm to make it run faster. Another thing I wanted to point out about this table is these results are all based on paths or like paths and tree augmentation in some sense. And that is kind of where these dynamic trees come in. Once I have dynamic trees, then I can efficiently do path updates. So I can implement some types of augmenting path procedures such as blocking flows efficiently. Recently, there's been um, a lot more work on the Maxwell problem, but via some sort of different techniques. In 2008, Dijk and Spielman showed how to use a new primitive, a nearly the new time Laplacian solver, combined with an iterative method for linear programming called an interior point method to solve the Maxwell problem in time m to the one, three halves log u. So, up to log factors, this matches the result of Goldberg Rao on sparse graphs. At a high level, where the runtime comes from is every iteration, um, Slater, uh, Deitch, and Spielman, they solve an electric flow problem, which I'm going to cover shortly. They, uh, it's shown in a seminal result of Spielman and Tang that is solvable in the near time. Additionally, they use this framework called an interior point method which proves that you can solve a maximum flow in square root m iterations. Um, so you do m times square root m, that's m to the 1.5, and that's where the runtime came from. Since then, there's been several uh, types of improvements. The first improvements over uh, directly using an interior point method for a max flow were given by Lee Sidford and Madri. What Lee Sidford showed is that on dense graphs, you can improve the iteration count to square root n, the square root number of vertices instead of edges. And Madri showed that on unit graphs, in other words, uncapacitated um, graphs with like u equals one, 
you can improve the runtime to m to the 10 over 7. So 10 over 7 is a little less than 3 halves. So after this, uh, more recently, there was a result of several authors which used data structures, um, but this time not for augmenting pads or trees, but instead for dynamic electric flows in some sense, to show that on all sufficiently dense graphs that you can solve the Maxwell problem in nearly the near time. So M plus N to the 1.5. And this result, um, well, our, the result I'm going to talk about today has some significant influence from the previous result on just the general setup and how we um, do a dynamic version of electric flows to speed up the iterative interior point method that I'm using. So given that most of the results on the previous slide that I just discussed were heavily influenced by interior point methods in electric flows. I better introduce what an electric flow is. An electric flow is a different type of flow problem. Um, so given an undirected graph G, we're going to say that an edge E has a resistance RE. The ST electric flow is the minimum energy flow. In other words, it minimizes this L2 sum RE FE squared over all flows that send one unit from S to T. So as recall, Fe is the amount of flow on edge E. So this is instead you're minimizing this L2 norm of um, all flows from S to T. So here, the sum of Re Fe squared is known as the energy. Physically, what this corresponds to is I um, have vertices S and T, and every edge is a, res is a resistor with resistance Re, and a battery is hooked up in S to T to induce the voltage drop. And just want to see how much current is on every edge. And that is what the flow vector is, basically, uh, up to scaling. So in this example, um, every edge has resistance 1. OK, uh, that's how we're setting it up. So what ends up happening is that for between S and T, there is, um, you send one half unit of flow on the path of length 1 between S and T. And you send one sixth unit on each path of length three. So intuitively, in this electric flow, um, it trades off between short pads, but also like even though there's one short path, it doesn't want to put it. But trades off between sort of congestion notion and some shortest path notion. As for why we're solving electric flows. Um, it corresponds to solving Laplacian systems, which is a certain type of linear system given by a graph. Solving a Laplacian system allows you to estimate hitting probabilities for random walks, like do some, any sort of spectral graph clustering, page rank, uh, or traffic modeling. Another very good reason to uh, study electric flows so, is now that we actually have an algorithm that solves it in nearly the near time, m log to the O of 1, of M. And this has been used in several key advances, as I discussed, towards solving the Maxwell problem or other flow problems. Additionally, even though the first runtime of Spielman and Tang in 2004 had several log factors, uh, in fact, as of recently, they've all been removed. Uh, the runtime is now M log log N to some number of uh, powers. At this point, I'm going to move into discussing how we're going to set up our um, dynamic electric flow framework for max flow. So to do this, I'm going to introduce uh, very briefly what properties of these interior point methods we're going to need. So an interior point method is an algorithm which solves a linear program um, in M variables by solving a sequence of square root M linear systems. For the max flow problem, these linear systems correspond to computing electric flows. So a more concrete graphical-based view of this that I think is nice to take for the purposes of this talk is given by Madri, where concretely you can prove that I can build a maximum ST flow by augmenting by a sequence of square root M electric flows. I want to contrast this with the notion of augmenting pads, which is the first approach we learned how to solve max flow. 
Here we're going to augment by electric flows, while normally you augment by patents. So uh, the basic approach to solving this problem is we're going to build the max flow from square root m electric flows. So if we, uh, uh, if we follow this basic approach of building a max flow with square root m electric flows, well, what is the runtime? You can solve this electric flow problem in O of m per iteration, and you need root m iteration. So naively, that's m to the 1.5 time. Additionally, the electric flow is dense. It does have some amount of flow on every edge in a general case because it's a convex optimization problem that is smooth, basically. So you're not going to just like um, miss some edges. So it's a dense flow. So if you really want to just use that flow every time, it's really hard to get past n to the 1.5. A natural idea to uh, break this barrier is what if we can adapt the method to actually reduce the number of iterations past square root m, which is the best known for interior point methods. Uh, so this approach is known to improve the runtime in unit capacity graphs. At this point, it's known that in unit capacity graphs, we can achieve m to the one third iterations. Um, this is given by a line of work, but this doesn't actually extend as far as we know to graphs with arbitrary polynomial capacities. So given that this approach of reducing iterations doesn't seem to work, the second idea is, well, maybe what I said about we need to compute the exact electric flow every single time is actually not true. What if we can just use an approximate electric flow every time and use a data structure to implicitly update it throughout the algorithm? Um, so in general, in this interior point method, um, the thing to specify for the electric flow is what are the resistances on the edges? That's going to tell me what the flow is. So the resistance on an edge in the algorithm generally is the inverse of the residual capacity squared approximately. It turns out that for the purposes of, an, of implementing an interior point method, that you actually only need these resistances up to a small multiplicative error, like a 1 plus epsilon multiplicative error, and that actually still suffices to make enough progress. This suggests a refined approach, which is even popped up in earlier work of Karma Kar and Vaija. So we're only going to update the edge resistances when it changes by a greater than 1.1 factor. And we can show this happens only O of m times. So basically, the high level idea for our data structure approach is we're going to uh, initialize an undirected graph G with some resistances. We want the data structure to support resistance updates. So we're allowed to change resistances. This corresponds to when the edge has its resistances changed by a more than one plus epsilon factor. And then we want the data structure to, um, we want it to report any edge that has a large amount of flow or energy on it in a ST electric flow under these changes. So let's say we have all these pieces. Then what we can do is we start running our method. And then when an edge has had a lot of change on it, like there's been a, a lot of flow pushed back and forth, well, then the data structure reports that. We compute what its new flow is. We change the resistance. And then we keep going. At a high level, as long as we can build such a data structure, such that the amortized runtime is a sublinear, like m to the 0.99 time, then you can actually improve over m to the 3 halves log u max flow. In this language, um, our first result is the following. We give a randomized data structure against oblivious adversaries. The guarantee um, of the data structure, well, the guarantee uh, for inputs of the data structure is that the energy of the ST electric flow is the most one at all times. This is a normalizing condition. It supports the following operations. You can initialize a graph G with some resistances. Additionally, it can update the resistance of any edge from R to R nu. And finally, at any point, we can call locate. And what locate will do is it will return O of epsilon to the minus two edges containing all edges with at least epsilon squared fraction of the energy. Um, 
And additionally, it doesn't actually matter if we're working with the true electric flow here or just some approximate electric flow. Um, so here where the O of epsilon to the minus two comes from is, well, the total energy is one by the normalization guarantee. And where one edges with energy at least epsilon squared. So there's epsilon to the minus two real edges. So the stage structure, it should return all the energies that are truly high energy. And then it's allowed to return a couple extras, basically. Uh, the main result we show in this paper is that this dynamic electric flow problem described here can be solved in amortized sublinear m to the 0.99 over polynomial in epsilon time per query. I want to point out a few curious things about this. Um, know how I say ST electric flow. Um, just as Maxwell, you can find electric flow for general demands. And in fact, it's more natural for a lot of reasons. Uh, but our data structure actually it really needs this ST property in a couple places, which I'll try to highlight later in the talk. So given this data structure result on the previous page, what we're able to show for the max flow problem is you can solve max flow on graphs with capacities in the range one to U in time M to the three halves minus one over 328 log U times extra polylogarithmic factors. This is the first improvement to the m to the 1.5 log, uh, long m log u time algorithm of Goldberg-Rau from 98 um, on sparse capacitated graphs. And the way we achieve this is to use the previous data structure to implicitly add a sequence of square root m electric flows to get our final max flow. And we're going to implement each iteration in some linear time. Finally, I'm going to try to set an outline for some sort of more technical points I'm discussing later in the talk by highlighting some curious aspects of the algorithm we build. The dynamic electric flow data structure I described only works for ST flows, um, which makes some of the later stages of, uh, of like getting the algorithm actually working to be very delicate. Another thing is that in the statement of the data structure theorem, I mentioned that the adversary had to be oblivious and not adaptive. Um, what these words mean is an oblivious adversary for a data structure problem. It means that while the data structure is randomized, the adversary can't see, um, well, the adversary can't see the randomness or maybe a different way of thinking about it is the adversary doesn't make its future queries depend on the output of the data structure. Um, however, this is not a legitimate assumption for the purposes of using this to solve the max flow problem because well, what am I saying? I'm saying I use the data structure. It tells me a flow and I want to use that flow to decide what edges to update. So the future changes I'm doing to the resistances depend on the returned flows. Um, but so we need, we do need to discuss how to do this oblivious versus adaptive handling. It turns out you can actually do some, well, some sort of not very principled approaches compared to uh, what's been studied for this problem in general, but still get it to work in the max flow case. Finally, in a standard interior point method, um, you need to do several centering steps between these steps where I add an ST electric flow to kind of just like, yeah, it's called bring it back to the central path. Uh, however, we need to modify our method to only work with ST electric flows and like avoid these centering steps basically. So that's one more change we make. For the rest of this talk, I'm going to highlight the dynamic electric flow data structure and I'll talk a little bit about the adaptive adversary issue. And I'm really just not going to cover point three at all. Okay. So yeah, that brings me to part two of the talk. Uh, just wanted to know if there's any questions up to now. Okay. Um, if not, I'll just keep going. So to introduce the, okay, sorry. Um, okay. So f for this part of the talk, I'm going to focus on describing, um, 
how we actually do our dynamic electric flow data structure that was discussed um, previously. To introduce this, I'm just going to introduce dynamic graph data structures in general and a framework for reasoning about them. The goal of, a, of data structures basically is to build efficient objects, uh, where efficient means, say, sublinear update time for processing changing graphs. For example, we can focus on the problems of edge connectivity, flows, shortest paths of reachability, or effective resistances, which is very important for the purposes of this talk. A nice framework or approach to solving such problems is to think about doing graph decompositions. We can reduce solving this data structure problem on the large graph to solving a similar problem on a smaller graph. A more formal way to reason about this is vertex sparsification. We want to reduce the number of vertices in our graph while still maintaining the important quantities, for example, edge connectivity or effective resistances between the set of vertices we care about in our graph queries. I think edge connectivity in this instance is a very great example. Um, the edge connectivity problem is under a graph with uh, edge insertions and deletions, we want to decide whether vertices S and T are C edge connected. In other words, are there C disjoint paths between two vertices S and T? There's been a long line of work on this. And recently it was shown that C edge connectivity vertex sparsifiers um, can be adapted or dynamicized to give an n to the little o of one time deterministic worst case update time for constants C. Just to put this back in the vertex sparsification language, what this is saying is that given a graph and given a subset of vertices, say like maybe say square root n vertices in the graph, I can compute a graph that has size approximately square root n, such that between any pair of these vertices, or like between any cut among the square root n vertices, the edge connectivity up to C is preserved exactly. So like you can actually prove this sort of object exists. And by computing it efficiently and making it dynamic, you get very efficient update times for the C edge connectivity um, dynamic graph problem. Additionally, there's been results uh, using such ideas to solve flows and shortest path problems. And the problem I'm going to really focus on in this talk is the dynamic effective resistance problem. So in work of DGGP and uh, CGHPS, they gave sublinear time one plus epsilon approximate pairwise effective resistances in dynamic graphs by using this vertex sparsification framework. Just to introduce more formally what the dynamic effective resistance problem is that I'm going to talk about. So on a graph G, we're going to let B denote the M by N edge vertex incidence matrix. Uh, we're going to define the Laplacian mentioned earlier, which is what makes the electric flow. Um, we're going to let R be the diagonal matrix of resistances, and L is B transpose R inverse B. The effective resistance between two vertices S and T is defined by the quadratic form induced by the inverse of the Laplacian. So chi ST, L inverse chi ST. Here, chi ST is the demand that routes one unit from S to T. So it's plus one in the S coordinate and minus one in the T coordinate. So, um, to compute this effective resistance, which is given by the inverse form of the Laplacian, well, one natural idea is to do this vertex sparsification framework. Let's take a subset of vertices C that contains S and T, and we're going to construct a Laplacian onto C whose inverse um, approximates the inverse of L for vectors supported on C. So, for example, for if C contains S and T, then the inverse form of L inverse on chi ST is the same, hopefully, um, on our smaller Laplacian as on the larger Laplacian. So concretely, we're going to ask for a matrix L sub C, such that for all vectors D supported on C, uh, D transpose L inverse D, the inverse form, is approximately the inverse form of LC. For example, in this graph, we can um, let C be the set of three vertices on the right, Turns out what you can do is you can kind of eliminate the vertex on the left. 
you can delete it, and you can add a triangle, uh, these three purple edges, each of weight one half. And you can collapse the one half and the one together to get an edge of weight one third by a like, parallel series rule for resistances. So it turns out that actually these graphs are completely equivalent on these three vertices in the inverse Laplacian form. And this is not like a special property of this graph, this is actually completely general. So you can actually prove that this matrix L sub C, which I'm asking to preserve the effective resistances exactly between uh, any vertices in C, it actually exists. It's called the Schur complement. It's given by the following formula where the Laplacian is written in the following block form. Another way to reason about this formula is that it's you're basically doing approximate Gaussian elimination on blocks to solve the linear system. So I'm going to eliminate out the block LFF and onto the block on the lower right by some sort of Gaussian elimination. That's how you get the short complement formula. The reason that this is so nice is that you can prove that the sure complement of L onto C is actually also a Laplacian matrix if the original matrix is also a Laplacian. Another way that the sure complement and the original inverse are related um, is given by the Cholesky factorization written here. So you can write L inverse as the product of three matrices, two sort of upper triangular block matrices and a diagonal matrix in the middle. And this sort of formula is useful for later. So our approach to maintaining this dynamic sure complement, uh, well, okay, our goal now is to describe how to maintain this sure complement dynamically, well, so under our changing graph. Because if we can make it dy dynamically, then, well, that allows us to maintain the effective resistances dynamically too. To solve this dynamic sure complement problem dynamically, uh, we're going to maintain a sequence of random walks. This is what was done in the previous work of DGGP. Um, at a high level, um, while this theorem is a little maybe complicated to see, what it says is that if I want to compute a sure complement, what I can do is, from every edge in the graph, I sample a bunch of random walks, until it hits this set C of vertices that I want to get the sure complement onto. Sorry. That I want to get the sure complement onto. So yeah. Okay, uh, let me just do this pictorially, actually. I think it's easier that way. So let's say we have this subset C of vertices on the left. And our goal is to uh, compute an approximate sure complement onto this set of vertices C. What previous work showed is that the following algorithm does this. For every single edge in the graph, I start at both endpoints and I run a random walk from both endpoints until it hits the set C. And then given where these two endpoints of the sets hit the set C and the length of the walk, I add an edge of some resistance. You can prove that with high probability, this is a one plus epsilon approximate sure complement. Well, I mentioned that we want dynamic sure complement, so how do we dynamicize this? Given this random walk approach, it's actually um, not too difficult. Just imagine we wanted to add this vertex V. Well, now the random walks just get shorter, right? Uh, the random walk from this vertex has shortened to V, and therefore this edge no longer exists, and instead this new edge exists. So to Dynamically maintaining the sure complement, we just, uh, under vertex insertions to C, we just can shortcut the walks to where they hit C. And essentially, this gives a full description of a dynamic sure complement algorithm. Okay. To maintain a dynamic sure complement under resistance changes, we're going to in initialize this sequence of random walks. When an edge E has its resistance changed, we're going to add both endpoints U and V to this set C that I described. So now we're going to update uh, the random walks accordingly just by shortcutting them to where they now hit C. Okay. Now notice that edge E is completely inside C, so we can just update the resistance um, as normally. 
when we get an effective resistance query, then we're going to add both vertices S and T to C. We're going to shortcut the random walks accordingly to where they hit S and T. And now we have, because we have a sure complement on the C, um, we can just solve this inverse form, chi S T, H inverse chi S T, where H is an approximate sure complement that we're maintaining using these random walks. And well, kind of by the definition of sure complements, this is a one plus epsilon approximate effective resistance. Step two of this actually takes sublinear time because the size of C is less than the size of the graph. And in fact, the, the time it takes is basically proportional to the size of C if we maintain a spectral sparsifier onto it. So like a sparsifier of this sure complement H that is a, uh, has size proportional to the number of vertices. And yeah, that, ba that basically gives an outline for how um, these like this dynamic effective resistance data structure works. Okay, at this point, I'm going to introduce a couple more electric flow concepts that will form the basis of the remainder of the talk. Um, for a demand vector D, we're going to say that a flow routes D if B transpose F equals D. The electric potentials given by demand D are when you solve the Laplacian on D, so L inverse D. The electric flow F is given by the potentials and Ohm's law. Um, so F equals the potential difference across an edge, phi U minus phi V divided by the resistance RE. So um, I just wanted to remind people what the dynamic electric flow problem that is solved in this current work. The problem is, given a graph G with source S, sync T, and some accuracy parameter epsilon, we want to support the following updates. We want to change the resistance of an edge E and query for the unit ST electric flow F, um, guarantee that the energy is the most one. We want to return a subset S of edges that contains all edges E that have energy at least epsilon squared. And the size of F isn't too large. It's O of epsilon to the minus two. The reason that this problem is harder than dynamic effective resistance is that in this case, we have to report all edges that we think have high energy. And in fact, these high energy edges might just be completely outside the set C that we're implicitly going to maintain. So you have to somehow use a smaller set of vertices to reason about edges that are maybe even far away. And that's where some of the difficulty comes in. To do this problem, we're going to use a approach um, called heavy hitters, and it's kind of based on the following intuition. Our goal is to find coordinates of a vector, r to the one half f, um, which are at least epsilon, and we're given that the L2 norm of the energy is the most one. So uh, we're given a vector with L2 and most one, and we want to find all large coordinates. Well, this is exactly the L2 heavy hitter problem. And we're going to use the following formulation. We can build a sketch matrix Q, which is epsilon to the minus two by n. If for any vector y, um, n dimensional vector, if, if I'm able to compute Q times y approximately in every coordinate, then we can return efficiently all coordinates of y that are at least epsilon. And the total time to do this is epsilon to the minus two. Finally, this sketch matrix Q has all entries in minus one, zero, and one. Um, as I alluded to, what you can do is use this for y equals r to the one half f. So our goal is to approximately maintain this sketch matrix Q times r to the one half f. So this is, if you write out the formula, you get Q r to the minus one half b Laplacian inverse chi st. And you want to maintain this under changes to these resistances r. So let's focus on this problem, uh, this formula for what we want to maintain. Um, at this point, what we do is we're going to write the Laplacian inverse as a Cholesky factorization. And if you expand everything out, you get this final property, this final formula here. Let me try to intuitively describe what this final formula is saying. Um, and this final formula has two parts. Um, the first part it has is what I'm going to call the demand projection. So 
the way to think about this is you have this q r to the minus one half b on the left, and this is some this is some like small number o of epsilon to the minus two vectors of length capital C, where C is this terminal set that I've described earlier. Um, so this is taking some it's taking these q vectors and moving them onto C. The right hand side is another length C vector. It's called, what, it's, what it's doing is I'm solving the Schur complement inverse on this st demand. So it's like computing the electric potentials on the Schur complement. And I want to compute the inner product of these parts approximately. Then once I can do that, well, then I can um, recover the large energy edges. So let me just focus on both these parts separately. Um, and then, you know, and then they can be combined to give this approximate inner product and we're done. So the first part I'm going to talk about is how, how do we maintain this sure complement LC inverse chi ST in sublinear time? Well, you can just directly use the dynamic sure complement from earlier. Um, you just compute an approximation to the sure complement L sub C, um, LC, and then just compute the inverse of that on chi ST. You can basically prove that a one plus epsilon approximate sure complement in this case just completely suffices for all our purposes. Now I'm going to go to the other side, maintaining these demand projections. So this is maintaining this matrix. As I described, Q is actually, it's a matrix that has O of epsilon to the minus two columns. So uh, we're just going to focus on maintaining one of these columns. So I'm just going to Q be a column of Q transpose. There is epsilon to the minus two of these. So Q is some minus one, zero, one vector. And we're just going to try to maintain um, for D equals B transpose, or to the minus one half, uh, little vector Q. I'm going to maintain this matrix on the left times D. So, uh, here I've suppressed the, uh, dependence on R because R depends on the Laplacian L. Like, oh, sorry, I mean, L depends on the, on the resistances R. So, here L changes, like the Laplacian changes via resistance updates, and I want to maintain this L of L of F inverse identity times D. The intent I want to convey for maintaining this quantity is that the left-hand side operator has a very natural interpretation via random walks that we're going to exploit to get our algorithm. Essentially, what this left-hand side matrix does it takes this uh, vector d on the right, and it moves the mass represented by d to this subset C via random walks uh, with exit probabilities proportional to resistance inverses. For example, uh, I'm going to explain how this operator works when D is a unit mass. So it's just like a mass on a single vertex V. I'm gonna to try to describe what this left-hand side operator is doing to vectors that look like that. So let's just consider the following graph again. And I have a mass one on this vertex on the left. The vertices C I'm trying to project to are on the right. So if I run a random walk from this vertex one, what happens? Well. I exit each of its neighboring edges with probability one third. So what's going to happen is this mass of one is going to move one third mass to each vertex in C via an, one of the exiting edges. That's what happens. And well, now this operator is linear. So once you understand what it's doing on a single vertex, you understand what it's doing to general masses D. So just to bring it back. I'm going to focus again on this quantity, LCF, LFF, inverse, ID. And we need an approximation of each coordinate up to plus minus epsilon. So let's recall that D equals B transpose, R divided by one half Q, where Q is in minus one, zero, one. Um, one kind of funny point is that if R is small entries, like some resistances are very close to zero, 
then this demand vector D actually has some massive, massive coordinates. And this really affects this approximation or stability in our algorithm. And this is one place where the STness of the flow actually really comes into play. The way we get around this point is we prove the following very simple lemma. Uh, for any edge that is sufficiently small resistance, say less than epsilon squared, its energy cannot be large, and therefore we can just completely ignore it for the purposes of the algorithm. The proof of this is um, just, well, we're focusing on a unit ST electron flow for our flow F, and therefore every edge is flow at most one. And therefore the energy Re Fe squared is the most Re is the most epsilon squared. So this says that for the purposes of our heavy hitter sketch, or like for edges we're considering, we can actually just throw out any edges that have super small resistance. And you actually can do a similar argument to throw out edges of super large resistance, but we actually don't need that here. But once you do this, well, now what do I know about the vector D? Um, uh, that, well, what, beyond being, well, yeah, so this is a big reason that we end up using ST flows because of this sort of stability dilemma that is only true in the ST case, unfortunately. So when you plug this in, you get that the, the coordinates of D sub V are most a degree over epsilon, basically. And because we're working with sparse graphs, we can just think of the degrees as being O of one and epsilon as being a constant, basically. So just think of D being like an O of one sized vector in every coordinate. Okay, so let's go back to maintain this quantity. We wanna take this mass D and we wanna move it via random walks to this subset C. Well, if I'm saying we need to maintain it approximately and you can do it exactly via random walks, then the natural idea is to just um, use random walks, but like sampled to simulate what this process is doing. So what this, is, what this means formally is, from a vertex, I'm just gonna sample a bunch of random walks until it hits C, and then use these random walks to decide um, how I'm moving this mass D to the subset C. Unfortunately, this actually just accumulates way too much variance for our purposes. Um, because recall that on the earlier side, I was saying that the coordinates of D are like plus minus one approximately in every single coordinate. So let's say that sampling a random walk contributes like one unit of variance or something. Even if I sample P random walks, um, the amount of variance I'm accumulating is like one over P, even if you average. Um, and basically the issue here is that because there's M vertices, if I'm accumulating one over P per vertex, then the, um, well, the total variance is M over P. So this doesn't really work in total. So the fix we do is instead of sampling a bunch of random walks um, up front to maintain our averages, what we instead do is we first compute this projection exactly uh, just by solving a linear system. And instead of estimating um, like estimating the actual quantity via walks, we're going to estimate the change in this quantity when we increase the size of C via random walks. So the nice thing about this is the initial error is zero. So even if we accumulate a little error per every change, it's actually still fine. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. okay. Um, so yeah, the... The fix we do is to estimate the change via random walks. And as long as every step, the change, let's say the error we accumulate is like delta, then you can actually do a super linear, or a super constant number of steps, um, accumulates of these like errors you get from a change. And the total error is still the most epsilon. So that's basically how we get around this issue of um, that like sampling random walks is not good enough if you do it upfront. And this basically completes my discussion of the um, data structure aspect of things. So yeah, just to recap one more time, what we do is we maintain these two quantities, the demand projection here 
and the terminal potentials. For the terminal potentials, we just use the earlier dynamics to complement algorithms. And for here, we do it by estimating this quantity with random walks, except we don't do it up front. We do it on the changes between these quantities. As promised, I'm going to discuss very briefly adaptive adversaries. The basic issue for adaptive adversaries is that previous algorithms randomness might affect future queries. So for example, the estimates of the data structure on an edge E will affect what its resistance looks like in the future and that that feedback might cause issues. Um, well, so the fix we do here is we're going to wrap this dynamic electric flow data structure I just described inside a separate algorithm, which we call the checker. What the checker does is it takes all the edges that this dynamic electric flow data structure um, outputs, and it will give its own estimates on what it thinks the energies are on those. So naively, you still need checker to be um, adaptive. Um, but the way you try to get around this is that you want to ensure that the extra edges that are returned by this heavy hitter data structure I built are um, not accepted by check. So like, basically, if this heavy hitter data structure that I just described returns a bunch of extra edges that are not actually important for the algorithm, this outside checker should reject them still. Um, so pictorially, this is kind of what's going on. Um, we have this locator, which is the heavy hitter, as we call it in our paper, in the main algorithm. And naively, they just kind of communicate back and forth. The algorithm will say, here's some updates. Locator says, here's the edges, and they just communicate. What we're going to do instead is throw this checker in the middle. And now locator communicates with checker, but locator can be against an oblivious adversary. And now checker is against an adaptive adversary, and it communicates back and forth with the main algorithm. Well, however, checker is actually a nicer thing to think about because it's just checking energy. So it at least is a nicer framework for reasoning about this issue. I mentioned the checker has to be against adaptive adversaries. Um, basically, the reason that we actually can end up handling this is that um, the central path of the interior point method is almost deterministic. It's like, it's like um, basically, like there at every single step, there is a fixed flow that like the algorithm wants to be at, and we can compute exactly if we decide to. So what we do is we advance for a little bit of time along the central path. And then we exactly recompute the flow we want to be at. And we update our data structures to like be in this state. So in that way, there's actually very little amount of uh, uh, like time along the algorithm where the amount, like where um, the, the, the flow we could have could be randomized, basically. So checker just has to be like semi-adaptive. It just has to be adaptive against all possible sequences that we could have encountered, where most places are deterministic, but a few places can be randomized. So you just kind of oversample a bunch and you get what you need. Okay. Great. Okay. So at this point, I'm going to try to put everything together and give our full algorithm. So here's our full algorithmic picture. We're gonna let k be our some like parameter, and the and the goal of the algorithm is to reduce the amount of residual flow by a k over root m fraction in m amortized time. The reason this is good is the number of such steps is root m over k. So the total number of time for this would be m to the one point five divided by k, which is hopefully less than m to the one point five. Uh, we're going to initialize our data structures, checker and locator, to accuracy epsilon. I'm going to do the following loop, root m over k times. 
which for every loop, we're going to split the loop into a bunch of very small steps. For every small step, checker and locator will return what are the edges that have at least epsilon fraction of the ST flow. And given these edges, I'm going to push the resistance updates of these returned edges to um, uh, these edges that are in this return set S to the algorithm and the data structure. So we're going to do this loop a bunch. And then after this loop, we're going to pay O of M more time to bring the flow back to the true central path of the interior point method. As I was discussing, this interior point method has some true place it wants to be at along the way. But within these batch steps, because of the data structures, we don't actually know it. So after these data structures, we're just going to say, like, OK, we're going to try to bring it back to where it really should be. So we can continue the algorithm. To analyze heuristically what the runtime of such an approach is, I want to point to the following places. Um, the updates to resistances in S contribute significantly to the runtime. Um, there's, in this case, there's k to the 16th such updates per batched step. Additionally, we have to call checker and locator to return edges S with at least epsilon fractional flow once per one of these mini steps. So let's say that each call to these data structure <coughs> pieces, the updates to S or the computations of all the edges with large flow requires time M to the one minus C based on our data structure claim. So uh, here's where the trade-offs happen. We're paying M per batch step times root M over K to be M to the three halves over K. This is for just like, uh, computation before and after the step to like recenter and everything. Additionally, there's k to the sixteenth updates per phase times root m over k phases times m to the one minus c per update. To compute this. This gives you m to the three halves minus c k to the fifteenth. Well, to trade off these quantities, you set them equal, and you get k to be m to the c over sixteen, because yeah. And now if c is some positive quantity. We get that the total runtime is m to three halves minus c over 16. So for example, if c is one over 100 even, like 0 0.01, this runtime is still less than m to the 1.5. So heuristically, this is why having a sublinear time data structure is enough to plug into the interior point method to get um, a sub m to the 1.5 time maximum algorithm. Finally, to get our log u dependence from um, that I was claiming for any arbitrary polynomial weights. Uh, what you can do is you just, uh, basically it's known that if I want to get a log u dependence for max flow, it suffices to solve log u instances on polynomially sized weights, like weights of size m squared or something. This is just a general capacity scaling fact for any algorithm. That's where our log u dependence in the algorithm comes from. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to wrap by discussing a couple extra points. Additional difficulties in making this analysis rigorous is that some resistance estimates accumulate over the course of several steps, and you do have to update those. Um, you do need to push those updates to the um, heavy hitter data structure and the checker data structure, but it turns out they just cost less. At this point, just let me conclude. So. We gave an algorithm that solves max flow in time m to the 1.497 log u on capacitated graphs. This is the first improvement to the m to the 1.5 log u time algorithm of Goldberg, Rao, and 98. Our approach is based on augmenting electric flows in a sublinear time algorithm for a specific instance of the dynamic electric flow problem. Precisely, we want to detect and return high energy edges in an ST electric flow that, on a graph that is dynamically changing. I think this work has several directions where we can improve or simplify places. For example, our outer method is highly tailored to our data structures in that we're only using ST flows. While a standard IPM uses general demands or circulations. And I was one, and I'm wondering whether you can maybe improve the dependencies in the interior point method we built 
or maybe improve the data structures to handle general demands. Um, additionally, our heavy hitter has large appendices on parameters, and it's only a slightly sublinear runtime. So maybe we can just improve our dependencies, or maybe a better problem to focus on is approximate dynamic effective resistance in general. And finally, our current solution to adaptive adversaries involves using a checker in this oversampling and specific properties of the determinism of the central path. Maybe just some sort of like resparsification or like randomness injection is a more natural way to handle it. And yeah. And yeah, that's my talk. Thank you, Yang. Uh, the, the sound cut out for a second. I think I was having a connectivity issue. Uh, but yeah. Do we still, uh, let, let's, uh, yes, I see th people are, are thinking already. Let's also, you're very welcome to ask questions in the chat. Uh, and we can also put you on stage if you want to ask a longer question. Yeah, I'm happy to take any amount of questions. And I'll also try to stick around afterwards too. Um, Let me see if I can see the chat. Or I think it's a little hard for me to see the chat in my current prison. Oh, we, so we have a question, which is, uh, what is the bottleneck that leads to one over three hundred and twenty-eight? Um, so the question was, what is the bottleneck that's leading to this <laughs> yeah, large yeah. one time and the three half minus <laughs> one over three twenty-eight? Um, well, I think there's a couple things. The main thing is that, as I described, we first built this data structure, and then we had to tailor the like adaptive adversary issue and the general interior point method structure around it. So first, the data structure already accumulates like a very poor runtime. Even the dynamic effective resistance data structures built earlier have like runtime m to the five six, and those are simpler. Um, and then, and then we had to do an interior point method around it that only uses ST flows, and this required us to take super super small steps, basically like scale down significantly from what is standard. That's where like we multiply by another factor. So this kind of a combination of all these things. Hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, that's the the only question in the chat for now. So let me see. Um, I guess one thing that very difficult to me is actually making the checker thing really like present an oblivious adversary to the locator uh, like if it's working not with com very high accuracy yeah. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. um yeah let, let me see if i can so the question was... Yeah, so I, um, I, I don't know, I'm just, can you comment on this? Like, how does the checker work why, without solving a very high accuracy problem? Or like, I don't know. Yeah, okay. So the question was, how does this checker locator interaction work without solving very high accuracy problems? <laughs> so maybe the first thing I want to convince you of is that the locator can be against oblivious adversaries. The thing that just returns edges that it thinks are important. So let's say locator, I just wanted to return any edge that has energy at least epsilon over 10. But for the purposes of the algorithm, I only want to accept edges that have energy at least epsilon. That way, any edge that gets passed from this locator to the checker, um, like locator won't forget any edges with high probability. It will only give extras maybe. And that way, locator, like the outputs of locator, don't end up affecting its own inputs because it is just passing a, a superset of what it really should be passing. Okay. So now I just want to convince you that checker can be like semi adaptive or something. So remember that between that, what the algorithm is doing is taking some very, very small steps. It's taking a step of size like m to the 1 over 328 or something. Um, and in this time, the number of edges that the algorithm ever updates is also like m to the 0 0.01. So very, very few edges are actually updated in this time. And between these times, the algorithm state is completely deterministic because the, in, the central path is deterministic. 
So as long as we oversample by an m to the 0 0.0801 or something, we can kind of union bound over all possible things that could have happened between two deterministic stages. And as long as you just oversample enough, just like cover all of that, then you don't even need to worry about it. Mm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 We're not really handling like a, like a, you know, like a principle. We're just saying like, we're just going to do everything, just gonna look at everything possible. Like, so uh, very nice. Uh, one more question. And then if, if there are more, no, no more in the chat, I'll let you go. But so is there like a clear limit to this type of approach, like something you shouldn't be able to go beyond? So the question was, is there like a clear lower yeah. bound to this kind of approach I'm discussing? Yeah. And from my perspective, I don't really know. If you tell me that, um, if you give me like fully adaptive dynamic electric flow that has runtime like almost constant over epsilon squared or something, yeah, I, I don't really know. Mm. Okay, last chance to put a question in the chat. And otherwise, let's uh, thank Yang again for a very nice talk. Yeah, thanks again for having me. Stay around a bit afterwards. Yeah. And I guess Ming will put us in, uh, in this uh, table mode now. So. <laughs>